Hi, everybody. Welcome to the BC Wheelchair Sports Show. I'm your host, Nate, and today I'm joined by soon-to-be four-time Paralympian, co-captain of the Canadian Wheelchair Rugby Team, the one, the only Trevor Hirschfield. How are you doing tonight, Trev? Good. Thanks for having me, Nate. No Wait worries. Wait the introduction there. Not a problem. So just to get things underway, I know I've talked to you a lot, um, but just for those people who are tuning in at home who might not know who you are, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself, um, how you've been involved in rugby? Okay. Well, geez, put me on the spot. Uh, so from Parksville, BC, I uh, got involved playing rugby shortly after my injury. Uh, Duncan Campbell, like many others, was the person that, that got me into into wheelchair rugby. So um you know in the beginning it was just i had a good time i had fun and then it became something like hey i might be able to to make this rugby thing maybe you know pursue pursue a career on the, the national team so um yeah i started working at it uh i eventually made the move to vancouver where there was a big uh, pocket of national team athletes training and so i was able to, to sponge off them and learn everything i could and uh, I eventually, uh, you know, got on the national team or got in the program in, in 2004. And I uh, cracked the roster for my first world championships in 2006. And those were in uh, New Zealand. So been been at it for a long time, but uh, each one is uh, special in its own way. So I'm um, you know, truly happy to, to still be on the team and, and still be able to, to do what I love. Yeah. And now the point of this series is this is our Paralympic profiles. So we're really focusing on the athletes, coaches, maybe even some support staff who are on their way to Tokyo in the next couple of weeks and also reflecting back on all of your Paralympic career. So, as you said, um, your first games were 2008 in Beijing. And I know that was only a few years after you made the team. So what was the experience at the first games like for you? Uh, the first games were just they're just wild. I mean, I'm, I just remember just absorbing everything, just all the countries there, um, you know, just how big of an event it is. And, you know, you, you feel like these superstar athletes when you're there, it was just, uh, you know, something I'd never, I'd never um, been a part of before. So it, it was, it was, it was quite fun. And, you know, we had, we had a great team too. So, um, it made it even more cool that we were able to be competitive in those games. And we ended up winning a bronze medal. So, I mean, first games with a medal was, was pretty special. And of course, family and friends made the trip over to Beijing. So being able to share that, that experience with them was also you know, pretty amazing. And I know for you, your dad was also on the bench for those games and equipment staff. Am I correct in that? Uh, he didn't come into London, so he did London and and uh, Rio games. So he was he was he was the guy in the beer garden in 08. So okay, having a good yeah. time in Beijing. Exactly. And I guess going off that, expanding on, on Beijing a little bit more, is in that games you hadn't really fully broken out as the superstar on the international stage that you are now. Um, so what was that experience like? Um, being an athlete that was. Uh, coming off the bench a bit more, kind of taking in the first games and learning from some of those veterans? Yeah, I mean, my, my court time was, was minimal. So every opportunity I got to get on the floor, I just, I just made sure that, you know, I was working as hard as I could and, and listening to the guys on the court with me because they were able to, you know, give me advice and, and show directions. So I was, I was really just trying to take it all in and trying to learn as much as I could watching you know, other athletes in my classification who were some of the best in the world. And then just watching some of the, the best athletes in wheelchair rugby in the world, and you know, just take it in and, and really try and learn. Yeah. And now your, your kind of big break came in 2010 at the world championships in Richmond, you know, you made the all-star team at world championships and you really established yourself as kind of the premier one in the world at that point. And then heading into London where you obviously had a, an incredible games, and what, what do you think was the difference for you between those years of 08 and 2012 um, in your training and your preparation heading into London? Uh, you know, I, I really think it was the, the people I surrounded myself with. I mean, I moved to Vancouver in 2008 leading into those games. So, uh, you know, that was just 
the tip of the iceberg training with guys like Garrett Kickling and, and Ian Chan, of course. And then, you know, all the other athletes that came to Vancouver to train as well. Just, we had quite a training group go in Vancouver for several years. And it was, you know, people would come to us to, to, to train and it, it, it really helped, uh, you know, kind of catapult my career and, and it, it really helped me just learn the nuances of the game. Yeah. And so now moving on, we're in 2012, uh, kind of in the timeline of things, London, really big games. I know the UK kind of went all out for that. Um, can you just talk to me a little bit about your experience in London and what those games were like for you? London was fabulous. By far one of the, the, the most spectacular games I've ever been to just the, the show they put on the opening and closing ceremonies, uh, the venues were full, just how much they, they pumped up Paralympics at that point. Um, you know, leading into that, you know, Beijing Paralympics was just something that came along with the Olympics and you were forced to run the, the Paralympics as well when you, you got the Olympic bid, but you know, it didn't feel like that in London. London really separated the two and, and they made a point of, you know, showcasing and highlighting, highlighting the amazing Paralympic athletes around the world. And, you know, that really, that really stuck out as to um, just how far the Paralympic, Paralympic movement had come to that point. And then I guess on the court, um, that was where you had quite a few major signature moments. I mean, obviously you guys won a silver medal. I'm kind of spoiling the story for anyone who doesn't know, uh, but you guys got silver in London, um, but to get there, it wasn't an easy road. And in the pool play against Sweden, you actually, as a low pointer, came up with a couple really clutch turnovers to kind of turn that game on its head. Um, what was it like being in those moments um, and just being someone who can make those plays at your classification? Yeah, we had our pool play was, was not easy by any means. We had a couple of tight games with some, some teams that maybe they shouldn't have been as close, but, you know, hats off to them. Uh, they came to play and, and being able to, to, you know, at my classification, be able to help my team out at, at that level and at that point in the game and, and make a difference is, it, it was, I think it was something that really, you know, people, people noticed and, and really highlighted me as, as a one point player. And now you guys got out of pool play and then you had one of probably the classic wheelchair rugby games and, and a really like exciting chapter in the Canada USA rivalry. Um, so USA obviously in London were quite heavily favored. Um, they gone several years, you know, without dropping many games. And then to start that game off, you guys came out and you had like what a five six point lead in the first quarter. Um, yeah, I think it was that game. So that that game was wild and. You know, it was, that game was probably easier to play than to watch, to tell you the truth, the way the scores were swinging. So I, I think the first quarter we got out to like a, a seven point gap there. So pretty unheard of in like uh, playing the U.S., Canada, U.S. game. They're usually nail biters pretty tight. But, you know, by the end of the game, that's exactly what it was. The U.S. had fought their way back and, and got some turnovers back and and. Um, you know, it came down to the last play in the game there where we were able to, to create a turnover and, you know, get that, that last goal where, you know, Garrett crossed the line at like 0.2 seconds or something like that. You didn't want to, you didn't want to give him any time to play with, but yeah, that was very unexpected, you know, going into that game, we knew it was going to be a tough game because the U S at that point is, was one of the best teams in the world. And. You know, like you said, mentioned earlier, I don't, I don't know that they had lost to anyone other than Canada up to that point. And, um, they, it was just really unexpected, but in the end, uh, you know, they fought back. Yeah, and uh, we came out on top, and that was, that was big for us. I don't at that point in my career, I can't remember exactly, but I think that might have been one of my first, my first wins against the U.S. squad. So it was pretty special. And then obviously you guys moved on to the final. Uh, you played Australia, and I know that didn't go the way you wanted. Um, but what do you say, you know, to people who say that you you lose the silver and you win the bronze? 
Do you have any perspective on that, especially coming out of London? You know, it's it's a hard game to be in. Um, you know, in 2014, we were in the same situation where we won our crossover and faced uh, Australia in the finals and, and came out short again. But uh, I think London was even more, was a little bit more difficult because we were out a bit early. So it wasn't even, it wasn't even a close game. You know, they just, they had our number at that point in time and uh, they played us well. And, and I guess, congratulations to them. They, uh, they just had the better team. But um, when you look back at things like nowadays, you look back at it and um, it's less that we, we lost the gold and, yeah. and came out with the silver and it was more the the people that you went through that with right the team you were there with right I mean obviously sucks we all want to win and yeah. we're all fighting for a gold and that's why we're putting all the work in but I think years down the road um now you look back at, at some special people you were able to ex share that experience with yeah. and on that roster I mean you had a lot of guys who, who you've been around with for for a number of years um, several vets, a number of your Team BC teammates. Um, but you also, that was uh, Zach Medell's first games, and he was just a young kid at the time, not quite the the established superstar he is today. Um, so what was that experience like for you as a teammate to kind of see him break out on the big stage like that and really just announce his presence to the world? Yeah, that was exciting. I mean, he came out uh, and he really – he really played well. Uh, you know, we all knew that he was going to be a superstar and he was going to one day be one of the best players in the world. But he, 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 he sure came out of that gate quick. Uh, a lot of the teams we were playing hadn't seen him yet, hadn't played against him yet, and didn't know what to expect. So I think he caught a lot of people off guard. And, um, you know, people really took notice after those games. Nice. And now, so we're three games down now. We got two – or. Yeah, uh, two games down, two medals, bronze and a silver, and then you guys head to Rio. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about the 2016 games experience and how that's kind of motivated and shaped you as a player leading into this quadrennial? Yeah, that was a that was a tough tough games. Um, earlier that year, we won uh, the World Wheelchair Rugby Challenge in in GB, so we were, you know, had that first place ranking coming out of there or being the first place team in the world coming out of there and, and you know we had some injuries leading into to rio so we didn't have much time you know as a full squad and not to make excuses but we went into those games and um you know i think i think we caught we were a little flat-footed in, in some of those especially in that japanese game um i mean we played some great games in that in Rio where yeah. you know that overtime win against Australia and maybe we're we're talking about something different at the Rio games right yeah but, no you guys especially in the pool play you guys had quite a few good ones you had that that GB thriller where uh you know you and Miranda's the low pointers came up with some really big plays um you know Zach and Mike were their usual selves and yeah that, yeah I mean it had its moments for sure as a team, I think we played really well. Uh, I just think, I think it might have been that we got that that GB or that Australia game, you know, went to, to overtime and we lost that close one where, you know, we we've been just struggling to beat Australia for so long, and especially in the you know 2012 2014 Worlds, and we were hoping to get get that one on them, you know, get that that monkey off our back. But and then the quick turnaround to the crossover and. I think, uh, you know, I don't think we played a bad game, but uh, it obviously wasn't our best game. Um, so, yeah, that's a, that's a hard one to, to swallow, especially when you're, you know, you're, you're there and you've been to a few games and, you know, you have a couple of athletes with their first games and it might be their first and only games. And, you know, you have a chance to, to help them, you know, win, win a Paralympic medal and, and you come up a little short. It's, it's a tough pill to swallow, but uh, again, I think those are all the things that, you know, drive us to, to continue to get better and, and to push ourselves yeah. onto the next ones. And, and heading into these games, you know, it's going to be your 
your fourth games, which is a pretty incredible achievement. You know, that's 12, 15 years on a national team. Uh, and you guys have a, a bit of a different look team this year. There's a few new names in the, in the group. You guys have a new coach who's, um, you know, been coaching your team since 2017. Um, what's that been like kind of adapting to a newer group and for you really taking on a large leadership role as a co-captain? It's been, it's been, it's been good. Like it hasn't always been fun, uh, you know, cause it's been struggles. Let's like, when we first came through, like Zach took time off after Rio to, to pursue, pursue his schooling. Right. So and then we brought in a bunch of, you know, younger, newer athletes. So it meant, you know, going back to the basics and, and re, reteaching the sport. So we, our coaching staff, uh, you know, Kote and Dave there have done an amazing job bringing everyone up to the same level of play over those years. And, you know, we, we had those struggles at World Championships in 2018 when we're, most of our, a big, uh, like group of our guys expect to win and, and we have to you know put that aside and learn to grow as a team and 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 help our newer athletes at that point develop and uh you know up to now where i think we, we got an amazing team right now you know i think people are sleeping on us um that's for sure not having seen us for 16 months but uh you know, when I'm seeing how we're playing, how uh, the guys have, have come along is, is very exciting. And, you know, let them sleep on us because we're common. Nice. And I like how you mentioned that that 16 month gap, because that's really significant right now. Like no one's really had a chance to see where a lot of the other countries are at, especially when you talk about the big five. Uh, and for those of you who are watching or listening who don't really know wheelchair rugby, um, when I say the big five is there's really been an established here um, that you'll generally see um, making it into medal rounds um, at Paralympics for World Championships. And it's, it's been fairly consistent for the past 10 years that it's been you guys, Canada, the USA, Australia, Japan, and GB, who's been really coming on strong in the past couple of years. Um, so what are you expecting from this games where so like it's so hard to predict how things are going to go yeah i mean first of all it's going to be exciting because um you usually get a taste of how the games are going to go prior when we usually have the canada cup in june right so you kind of get like kind of a look into how things are going to play out uh the pools might be different at that after that but you, you kind of get a feel of where everyone's at what kind of lines they're running so right now it's just smoke and mirrors. Everyone's keeping things quiet. No one's really putting much out there. And, and those first games are going to be pretty electric when, uh, you know, for us, uh, our first game is obviously a must win, which all of them are if you want to be successful. But, um, you know, teams you haven't seen in 16 months have played against and they haven't seen you, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be exciting um, for, for the players, for the people watching. And then of course, I mean, we're a contact sport and you're looking at the Olympics right now and how many people are, you know, getting injured or, or pulling up injured or, or whatever it is. And um, anything could happen, right? It's, there's a whole lot in play in these games. So it's, it's going to be a wild ride. Well, I look forward to, to watching as a spectator, obviously. Um, but yeah, looking at that again, I, I like how you kind of brought up injuries. You brought up the 16 month gap. So what is training and preparation for these Tokyo games been like, and how have you as, as an athlete adapted to all of these changes that are going on in the world right now? Yeah. I mean, I've been pretty lucky being here on the Island. Um, I got access to a couple of places that, you know, aren't public. So, um, I was able just to use them on my own and. Uh, I was able to, you know, get some, a rowing erg and a hand cycle and whatnot into a, a, a storage unit and kind of turn that into a gym. And, and then for the most part, a lot, BC has been pretty good with lockdowns, you know, here and there, we got shut down for a bit, but for the most part, things have been pretty open and, you know, a lot of it is just getting outside. So everyone's been forced to be creative 
Yeah. Uh, you see it across the world. You see it across all the other wheelchair rugby players, how they were able to be creative. I think uh, for us, one of the big things is the amount of contact we've been able to, to get is, uh, is very important with all the training camps we've had. Uh, we've been playing against each other, but at least you're taking those knocks because uh, you, you know what I mean? Your body's obviously gets used to them. And when you take some time off, uh, you can be pretty sore. It's, I mean, going into our first two training camps, you come out of those feeling like you're in a car accident. So it's been, it was good that we were able to, to get a lot of training camps in, even though, you know, we're banging against each other, but uh, it's all in, uh, you know, preparation. And for you, you've been on the national team, you've been on the international level for 15 years now, which when I say that to you probably sounds pretty surreal. Um, what major changes have you seen in the sport and in the game throughout your your career? Well, a lot. You got to remember, I started pre-shot clock. So the, the strategy was a lot different back then, especially when we had like two monsters like Whitey and G on a high low when it was just, hey, get the ball over half, you two little points, lock somebody up and we'll just play Post catch for a quarter. Ball. Yeah, and kill the clock. So, I mean, obviously the the shot clock coming in has made the game so much quicker and so much more entertaining for fans and, and, and actually being a part of it. Um, you've seen strategy change. And uh, I think the way our game's going is, uh, there's, there's a lot more set plays throughout at certain times in the game yeah. you're going to see things based on who's got the uh, arrows who's got possession of the clock it's definitely a lot of much more of a, a chess match than it, it was when i first started out and I, you know it makes it makes it uh, that much more exciting i mean you can't just have guys coming out pushing as fast as they can they got to know what's going on out there too so uh i think that's some of the big biggest changes i've seen um you know outside or you know outside the the rules or or the strategies of the sport uh, you just see how much the paralympics and, and fans have taken to wheelchair rugby and have fallen in love with it each game you know it's one of those premier sports where people just want to go watch i mean you go brazil i mean sorry uh, beijing it was sold out eight thousand fans you go London, it was sold out. It was like 12,000 fans. And then like, however many were in Rio it was sold out in a big stadium. We're just, you see that we're pulling those fans and people want to come watch and you know, the sport that you love is, is entertaining others and it's great. Yeah, and obviously spectators is, is going to be another big question with Paralympics this year. We don't know quite yet what's going to happen there, but we do know that it's going to be broadcast quite well all over the world. There's going to be unprecedented coverage um, in Canada, so your friends, family, and your probably two biggest fans, your two kids can definitely tune in and cheer for dad. So that's exciting. Yeah, yeah, they'll see how much they actually sit down and watch. But yeah, I mean, and, and hats off to this to CBC, who's you know really for the last few couple of years has you know taken that Olympic Paralympic movement and really ran with it, and you know have highlighted just how amazing all these athletes are. Nice. And yeah, I, I guess I'll finish up my formal questions uh, just with one, one final question for you here um, on the rugby side of things is what, what's the biggest lesson that you've learned throughout your career that kind of helps you now as you're preparing for this, you know, fourth games and what keeps you going? Oh, man. I think one of the biggest things that really, you know, helped me in my career was I just started having like a short memory on the court where errors, turnover, stuff like that. I was able just to switch it off, you know, I, I ref bad calls and stuff like that. Uh, early on, obviously, you know, bad call or, or you felt was a bad call, you kind of get a little amped up and now you're, you're out of position or whatever it is, or you know, something you thought that you could catch or whatever, you, you fumble it. And I think that was something that really helped. Um, I mean, 
I think it's important to have that with, with while you're playing, while main while maybe going back and revisiting that after the game yeah. and seeing where you can make your changes or what you can fix, right? Just so that you're able to stay focused while you're in the moment. Because it's it's happening so fast now. The game is so quick. It's uh it's always been one between the whistles and with all the function that's out there now, it's even more important. Awesome. Well, that was great. I really appreciate you kind of sharing your Paralympic journey with us uh, and answering all those questions. I know some of them are a little probably deeper than others, uh, and I, I appreciate that. Uh, now we'll just get into some fun stuff so that people can get to know you off the court and they know the person uh, behind the athlete that they're rooting for. Uh, awesome. Let's go. So uh, what's your go-to pregame meal? Oh, man, I – always been like the peanut butter jelly guy something that uh it's not going to upset my stomach and you know just been sticking to that for many years nice uh favorite teammate to room with oh you put me on the spot because it's all of a sudden i don't put people in there it's uh i'm gonna say it's been really fun rooming with with brandon troutman lately uh he's a young kid who's definitely an upper comfort definitely keep an eye on him but just like i'm the old guy on the team now so i have that that young guy in there yeah. teach me all the stuff that's cool these days and it's been it's been a blast he's he's a riot uh sport you would do if you couldn't play rugby oh surfing that's where surfing. i'm at right now i'm loving it yeah. i've been all over watching it at the olympics entertaining stuff Surfing. Okay. Um, ideal post games vacation spot. If there was no restrictions, uh, the plan was to go down to Okinawa for a bit and spend some time there. Uh, love the tropics, love the warm water, love the ocean. So, I mean, it's got to be somewhere like that. Maybe South Pacific, maybe Tonga, or Tahiti. But those are that's my jam. Yeah. Pre game mix constantly changing constantly so i'll probably end up uh, leading into the games here put together a bunch of songs on a mix and i tend to to put my headphones on right from leaving the hotel until you know i'm, I'm strapped up and almost ready to go i like to just to just you know kind of go blank a bit yeah you know so yeah. Yeah. I know you're a bit of a, a superstitious guy who likes his routine. So, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mean, it's, it's here and there. But uh, when I really want to make sure that uh, all cylinders are firing, I try and stick to it. Yeah. All right. Um, I, oh, I don't think I have anything else there for you. Uh, if there's anything you want to add, anything you wish people knew, um, about you or about wheelchair rugby leading into the games. Uh, now's kind of your chance to let us know to share that um, and get some word out. All right. Well, if you haven't seen it, watch it because you will not be sorry. You will be an instant fan and then you will be flying all over the world to watch it after. Um, just thanks to everyone who's always, you know, come out to the Oval for Canada Cup or, or supported us from around the world. It means a lot, and, uh, you know, we're aware that you guys are there. So thanks a lot for that. Uh, story about the time change, it's going to be a doozy. If you, you, you're going to be drinking a lot of coffee. But uh, if you're up and you're watching, we definitely appreciate it. Let us know. I mean, whether it's me or other teammates, send us some photos. Yeah. Let us know you're supporting us, and uh, uh, thank you. Yeah, and I believe offhand the time difference um, for those of us who are in the Pacific time zone, uh, like Trevor and I am now, it's about 18 hours. Um, both BC Wheelchair Sports and Wheelchair Rugby Canada uh, will be posting full schedules in uh, times or Canadian times um, so that people can stay up to date with the team, watch all the games. Uh, as I said, a lot of it will be covered by CBC Sports and available to watch. Um, so it'd be great to tune in. Um, from the BC Wheelchair Sports side of things, we're going to be posting a bunch of content around 
um, the Paralympics, the games, and also some of our alumni who've had fantastic uh, careers and Paralympic moments over the next several weeks and months. Uh, you can check those out across all of our channels. And of course, uh, subscribe and follow our podcast, the BC Wheelchair Sports Show. Uh, we're still building it. And we appreciate everybody that tunes in. Uh, I know, Trevor, this is probably your first time coming on, uh, but I'm sure it won't be the last uh, because you're heavily involved uh, in BC Wheelchair Sports. And I just want to thank you um, for all that you do, not just on the court, but off of it, um, being a great ambassador for the sport and really helping, you know, develop a lot of other rugby players around the province, whether they're <laughs> recreational athletes like me who are just having a good time and getting a push in, uh, or whether they're some of our more um, competitive and developing athletes who are uh, coming up and working on improving their skills so that they can be the next you. I uh, really appreciate it. Yeah, Nate, thanks for everything, man. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I'll definitely be back. Definitely be back. We'll have to get you and me between two ferns or something. Yeah. We are hoping to get uh, a nice, good BC rugby reunion episode uh, put together as part of our 50th anniversary series. Get a bunch of you guys on from the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. Uh, the good times, the bad times, and as I'm sure you know a little bit of the ugly. Uh, yeah. Just share some stories and get everybody together. But yeah, Trev, best of luck in Tokyo. Uh, best of luck to the team. Uh, Canada's Paralympic journey in wheelchair rugby, I believe, starts on August 27th. No, 25th. Uh, 25th. Uh, that, there it yeah. is. Yeah. And runs uh, runs for five or six days. So hopefully we'll see plenty of Canada. And see you guys back on the podium. Excellent, Nate. Thanks a lot. Yeah, have a great one, Trav. Enjoy the night. You too.